But if we could take our seats, please. I want to see this. So, our third presenter tonight is Susan. Susan is an assistant professor in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology, which I always want to say, and teaches at the OSU Marion campus. She got her PhD from the University of California, Riverside, with a dissertation about the conflict between male and female vocal field crickets over mating rate. I don't really know what that means, but this is like the age of crickets, like fighting over sex, um, and the consequences of female preference for novel mating partners. She was a postdoctoral researcher at both Sorry. Illinois State University and the University of Ottawa, and started her position here at OSU last fall continuing her research on the evolution of chemical signals in flies and beginning research on reproductive behavior in bed bugs. It's, uh, okay, I didn't, uh, a little bit last minute I didn't get to uh, practice this, so I think at one point just flipping randomly through slides trying to get to the end is there, but, um, <coughs> okay. Um, so I, I, the first part is just kind of general background um, to, to set the scene because I think this is all stuff that people probably learn at some point and then forget later. So when I usually run into adults, they ask me questions and they don't remember this stuff anymore. So I'm sorry if you remember it all and think I'm being obnoxious. But um, so natural selection is basically competition between different organisms of the same species to be able to survive and to be able to pass on the genes to the next generation. And you know, we usually think about evolution leading to adaptations or, you know, things that help the organism to be able to survive in their, in their environment. So we have this general idea that organisms should be adapted to the environments in which you find them. But um, there's this kind of a myth that evolution is leading to some kind of perfection that I often have to contend with when I'm talking to people. And evolution does not need to, does not lead to any kind of a, a universal perfection. There's no universal optimum for how anyone is supposed to be. Um, and the reason why you never hit any kind of a universal optimum, well, there are many reasons why, but just briefly to talk about a couple of them. The first thing is that organisms are always chasing some kind of a change in the environment. That's not. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, you could be, you, you know, you could be very well adapted to your white sandy environment, but if you were plunked down in the, the black, um, a volcanic rock, you would be extremely obvious and would get immediately eliminated. Um, so the best way for you to be is dependent on what environment that you're in and environments change. Um, the best way for an organism, organism to be is also dependent on what other organisms are around them. And so organisms, other organisms are part of um, an individual's environment. So um, you know, if you're been living somewhere peacefully forever and then suddenly a new predator arrives, um, this presents a, a challenge to the way that you have adapted your current environment, you will have to change. Um, another reason why we can't all be Superman is that we have a variety of different genetic constraints. So we have a bunch of different traits that we may want to be the strongest and the fastest and the biggest, but you may not be able to be all those things at the same time. Um, genetic linkages between traits may prevent those traits from evolving independently from one another. So. Uh, you know, they found out back in the 50s, but, you know, they were kind of working on uh, some of the animal husbandry aspects of genetics that, um, for example, you can't simultaneously breed for large size in chickens and also large egg size. Um, so that, that's a genetic constraint that we all have for breakfast every day. Um, <laughs> so I, I said I would talk about um, levels of conflict, and then I just ended up with carrying this down not very much, talking about levels of conflict, but um, so there are multiple ways, there's multiple, multiple scales of conflict that happen within biological organisms that are all important to evolution by natural selection. So one level of conflict would be conflict within the individual. So um, this is what you usually refer to as, as trade-offs if you're talking about uh, different traits within the same individual. So our friend Anthony Kindness is an example of that. You guys seen this guy in the news? This is the this is a little more supial that um, the males, um, like, they put so much investment into mating that they die almost immediately after they finish reproducing. So they mate, 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 die. <laughs> um, if you look at females of the same species, they, they need to live quite a bit longer and they don't undergo the same pattern. Um, so the trade-off that this individual is making is between reproduction and, and long-term survival. They've clearly waited all of their, put all their 
um, resources into your production and survival. Um, so I worked on ecological immunity and insects quite a bit, and so I, I worked on a variety of different crickets uh, myself in my own work, looking at trade-offs um, in the amount of effort that individuals put into um, immunity and maintaining their immune defenses and how they trade that off against your production. And I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, you have trade off, uh, you have um, conflict between individuals of the same species, so between parents and offspring. You um, are expected to find conflict unless the parent only has one offspring, I suppose, um, because um, if a parent is going to have multiple offspring throughout their lifespan, the first offspring is 100% devoted to getting all the resources that can from the parent, but the parent has to be allocating some resources for now and holding some back for later so that they can have more offspring in the future which automatically sets up a conflict between the parents and the offspring, um, with the offspring wanting to get more and more and more resources, and the parents want to hold them back. Um, we also get conflict between males and females, which I'll talk about in a lot of my work. Um, if you look at slightly larger groups, um, for social insects, you have conflict between the individual and the larger group. So even if all of the insects are gaining benefits from living socially and working together, um, if, uh, for example, in bees, um, the females, they gain, they gain benefits from working together as a group, but they gain even more benefit if they can somehow lay the next queen and raise her up and she can be the queen, and then they produce a queen. So, you know, just, just go for that last little punch there and get even more benefits than they would from hanging out in the group. So there's always that level of conflict um, between individuals working for the benefit of the group and individuals working for the benefit of themselves. Then if you go to the largest possible scale, to the level of a population, um, what any one individual should do um, may depend on what everybody else is doing. So you may have this kind of push and pull between how the individual is and how the rest of the population is. And there's a million examples of this, but just I just picked one related to sexual selection. So um, in guppies, males that are unusual looking um, are preferred by females. So how are you unusual looking? Well, I guess it depends what everyone else in the population looks like. So there's always this push and pull to be unusual looking, but how you should be depends on what's usual in your population. And so it's a, it's a moving target. So I'm going to talk about sexual selection today. And sexual selection is a competition among members of one sex for the opportunity to reproduce with members of the opposite sex. This is almost always males competing for access to females, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, although there are some examples of the reverse. Um, so sexual selection can take the form of um, displays, so what we go to on the left there, in which males are putting on displays and females are, are choosing one male over another male, or they can be aggressive interactions like on the right, in which males are fighting directly for one another and the female will, will make the winner. Um, so what you tend to find if you look at animals, uh, well, almost organisms, is that, is that there are different strategies for how you maximize fitness. Um, so, most, in most species, females are limited in the total number of offspring they can have in their lifespan. Um, so their goal is usually to maximize the quality of the offspring that they're able to have. And so their strategy um, should be to go out and meet with as high quality males as they can, or males that will, with them, produce the highest quality offspring. Um, but with males, they have more options. They can usually, um, they can usually have many, many more offspring than female, females can. So their goal is not only to maximize, maximize the number of offspring, I mean the quality of the offspring they can have, but also maximize the quantity. So they can mate. Um, so the way they can do this is by mating with many high-quality females who only mate with him. So they want to mate with as many females as possible, and they want to keep the females from mating with any other males. And if they can achieve this goal, this male will be able to have more offspring in the next generation. Um, so you have slightly different goals between males and females that will lead to the highest possible fitness. Um, and as a consequence of this difference in what is likely to cause males versus females to have the most viable offspring in the next generation, you sometimes end up with um, sexual conflict. And this is when you have some uh, competition among males that leads to the females becoming harmed. So here's two examples. This is a mating ball of garter snakes. and so. Um, the female is in the middle there, the males are all trying to mate with her. Um, the males will come out first for the, from the winter hibernation, and the female, this is the first female, come down the path, and all the males will form a mating ball around her, and sometimes the females can get injured or die in the process of all the males trying to mate with her. Um, here's a bed bug, so I, I don't know how to describe the whole bed bug deal. Um, but in uh, Drosophila, uh, Melanogaster. Oh, you've got to tell them. 
<laughs> well, okay. <laughs> um, so in bed bugs, um, the males actually, the females don't actually have external genitalia, genitalia anymore um, because um, I, I guess probably the evolutionary path by which this happened is that the males gained advantage from mating with females when they were still virgin, and so they would end up piercing the outer surface of the females. Um, the outer surface of the female skin, so a, a cuticle. So what's happening here is the female has actually developed an adaptation, which is a small little uh, sperm ledge, which is a place on the, on the belly there that can receive being pierced by the male's um, genitalia. So he actually um, pierces her body and, and directly deposits the sperm into her body. Um, and so this is obviously causing the female to get punctured over and over and over again. Although in the and she has all this counter application kind of spot, so when she gets punctured there, it does not damage her as much as he, he punctured her somewhere random on her body. So this is another example of sexual conflict in which you have um, male behaviors that, that are in some ways harmful to females. Um, and, and then in the top of the Lanagaster, the males that um, have, they have a substance in their ejaculate that helps males compete with other males in, in, sperm, um, in the sperm competition to fertilize a female's uh, eggs, but that same substance causes females to die more quickly. So the males, you know, it's not as though the males are mean and they're trying to kill the females. It's that at some total, there's got to be a total advantage to the males of having these substances and these, these behaviors that cause them to get a higher mating success, even though it happens to harm females in the process. Yeah, but they're just misogynists. <laughs> it, talking about uh, sexual uh, conflict over nuptial feeding gifts, and so, uh, I don't know, these are just a bunch of orthopterans and... Sorry, so they nuptial feeding gifts. They're just, yeah, nuptial feeding gifts, and so I'll, I'll have that on more slides. <laughs> so these are just a bunch of examples of the diversity that you find in nuptial feeding gifts um, in orthopterans. So you can see this thing here. This was something, it's attached, this is a female, this is attached to a female, she's just made it, and the male gave her that. Um, so this is this large blob, so you imagine the male's about the same size as the female, and you made that. Um, so you can see all of these guys have one. There's other kinds of nuptial, nuptial feeding gifts. So uh, in snowy tree cr crickets, the male has a little gland under his wings, and the females nibble on that until they're able to take secretions from that. Uh, this is a leg of a um, I think, and the, male, the female will actually bite on a spur on the male's legs, and, and um, Use and drink glands, you know, secretions from that. And this is, um, this picture is hard to read, but this is Cithodera strepitans, which I, this is work that I've done. Um, and the female will mount the male, and then she will chew and consume his hind wings. And if he has already made it a couple of times and has no hind wings left, she won't mate with him. So, good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> so I you have to buy it for your sweetie. <laughs> 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 so, I'm going to just briefly present um, a lot of that I did in decorated crickets. So, what happens in decorated crickets when, you know, just an orange, you know, what they do in the day? The male sings, and you can see he has his little gift sticking out of his palm there. Uh, the female will come over and approach the male and mount the male. In, um, in most orthopterans, there is no coerced mating um, for females, so females, mating only happens if the female likes them and if she mounts them, there's no other options. Um, so then she has mounted him and then what he does is he passes up from his genital opening to hers a, uh, both the sperm packet and the courtship gift. And the courtship gift. What is it? The bling? It's a packet made of amino acids in this case, so different organisms have different kinds of secretions. Yeah, <laughs> this is a, yeah it, it looks, yeah, it just looks like, it looks like that. I'll show you a picture in a second, but it really just looks like a glob of epoxy glue or something. So it's like you it to it's a tiny thing. So he passes up to her and, it's, and it covers the outside of the sperm packet and then she eats it. So she bends over and she pulls it off and she eats it. And um, so, yeah, she will consume this from that It's really sticky and she can't put it down even if she wants to. And so she starts <laughs> chewing this sticky, sticky thing and she's got her palps all involved in it and she can't really put it down. Um, and what 
And while she's doing that, she can't do this next thing, which is to reach over and remove the sperm packet. Because once she removes the sperm packet, she no longer receives the sperm from the male. Okay? So um, the spermatophyllite, or the, 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 the gift, prevents her from removing the male sperm packet, terminating sperm transfer. Okay? So you can see why this would be a good thing for the male to give her, right? Because it keeps her um, receiving his sperm. Um, so, there's a, a bit of a trick though to courtship feedings, which is that in some species you find that the courtship feedings actually improve offspring success. So, the, you know, if the female eats it, she'll have more offspring or, you know, more viable offspring. But, um, you also find that in many species the courtship feedings are what are known as a sham. So it's a sham gift. Meaning that when the females eat this gift, it doesn't help their offspring at all. Not at all. Okay? The female gets no benefits from consuming this gift. Um, so, basically what it amounts to is if it's a sham gift, the courtship feeding benefits the male because it distracts the female. So she's chewing this thing and all the sperm is transferring into her, into her sperm storage organ. So he's succeeding in getting more sperm into her. Um, and the other advantage for the male is he hasn't actually given her anything that he needed. It was just a bunch of amino acids. He didn't you know, provide her with any vital nutrients that were going to help her. So it saved him some effort. Okay? So this is why. What? Oh, yeah, I'm not going to Okay. Um, but the sham courtship <coughs> gifts can be harmful to females because they actually harm, they prevent the female, you know, she's taken all the sperm in, so it prevents her from having the opportunity to mate with other males and having more genetically diverse offspring. Um, so basically, there is selection over evolutionary time for males to make increasingly cheap sham gifts that the females are unable to refuse. And there's also selection for females to become more and more resistant to these, to eating these worthless male gifts. So you get this push and pull. The females are, are trying to not eat these things, and the males are trying to make them more and more irresistible and difficult to put down. So basically, this is dating. <laughs> <laughs> or dating is this. Yeah. Um, so, so, so just emphasize that in this species, um, so you can see here's an actual picture, she's eating with her phylax and there's a sperm pack still attached to her, and in this species, we know that the gift is a sham, okay, it does not help her have more offspring or better offspring. Um, and so males are benefiting by making the spermatophylax more and more appealing, and females are benefiting by resisting eating this. So, <clears throat> I did a project looking at conflict over courtship feeding, and so we know the um, spermatophylax is made up of these amino acids. The ones that are in red here are ones that <coughs> have been found in other insects to have a phagostimulatory effect, meaning they stimulate eating. So it's something where if you eat it, it stimulates you to eat more. I mean, we have the same humans too. But I did not do that. Well, that's fine. Um, so my question was, how does the amino acid contribute, composition of these the spermatophylax contribute to the gustatory appeal, meaning whether she wants to eat it or not? And does the composition of, so sometimes females will eat the gift, sometimes females will eat it for a little while and drop it. So I wanted to know um, if the composition in terms of the amino acids is different in the ones that the females like versus the ones that the females reject. So it's the ice cream cone versus the don't eat me. And because this is a trait that's made up of a bunch of different amino acids, um, it's a complex trait, and I had to use multivariate such as selection and various quantitative gen genetic techniques to address this, but I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to show you what I found. So, what we found is that um, if you look at the fitness surface described by the amino acids um, that were in this gift, um, we ended up finding three significant um, principal components, one of them which corresponded to what we're going to call taste and one with texture, and we found that there's two ways that you can make a spermatophylax that females find attractive, which gives you a shape like this. So this is a good one, and this is a good one, and this is a valley, so that's bad. So instead of having a single best way to make a spermatophylax, there's actually multiple different pathways by which you can combine amino acids to make an attractive spermatophylax. Um, what? That's good. All right, I watched them only like two slides. Um, so the next thing I want to know is whether there was um, a genetic correlation between female resistance and spermatophylax attractiveness. So was, are there genetic constraints that, can, that um, prevent each of these traits from evolving independently? So we did an experiment in red lines. And um, the first thing we found is that female resistance to consuming spermatophylaxes, like how likely they are to reject the spermatophylax, has a genetic basis. We also found that um, male spermatophylax attractiveness has a genetic basis. So some males produce 
more or less attractive spermatic biases, um, and that there was a negative genetic correlation between female resistance to feeding on the spermatic biases and the attractiveness of the spermatic biases. I will say that more simply in the next slide, but basically, the genes that make females susceptible to feeding on spermatophylax is linked to the male genes that produce more manipulative spermatophylaxes. So, say that in one last way. Um, it appears that there is um, selection on females to be more resistant to eating spermatophylaxes, um, and there's selection on males to have more attractive spermatophylaxes, but neither sex is able to um, achieve their optimal fitness because the genes that control the female resistance and the genes that control the male spermatophylax attractiveness are linked to one another. And so these two traits can't evolve independently. Um, and as a result, males and females are forever going to be locked together in this push and pull um, where each sex is trying to uh, maximize their fitness. So, thanks. That's all. <laughs> Are females generally, uh, are they able to metabolize the amino acids uh, presented in the spermatophylax? Um, it's possible that they're not. I mean, they're eating it, um, but it's not helping their offspring at all. So I don't know if they're not metabolizing it or they're metabolizing it and it's not useful. Because, I mean, if, it, if they're able to metabolize those amino acids uh, and gain some sort of energy from them, then, you know, it, it at least confers some survival advantage, if not a reproductive advantage. Uh, well, yes, so you think it would come out somewhere, so just basically when you track females, you know, if you feed them, in, you know, different numbers of spermatophyllases, you don't find, if, if it does add to their overall survival and they're not translating that into having more or better babies, then it's pointless anyway, right? Because their their goal is just to, their, their goal is to have, what's that? Yeah, 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 go ahead, sorry. No, no, I mean, because, you know, they're, I mean, you know, we all want to have good quality of life, but really from, you know, an evolutionary perspective, the goal is just to have, have the most viable offspring are going to make in the next generation. And so even if it did contribute to their overall, um, some aspect of their health in some way, if it doesn't translate into having more offspring or better offspring, then it, it's not helpful to their fitness. So crickets are uh, detritivores, right? Yeah. So I mean, it seems like it would be beneficial because they're getting more you amino want... acids in that than they would just feeding on mm -hmm. king plant matter, right? Right, but it could be that the, the balance of amino acids in there isn't really supplying them with anything that they particularly need. I mean, it just, we just know empirically that it doesn't seem to help the offspring. Are, are there essential amino acids present within the spermatophyllite? Um, I don't know. I mean, we just know this is, this is the we got. So. so red is what's in there? No, everything's in there. Uh, red are just the ones that we know have a phagostimulatory effect, so those are interesting because if the males are able to maximize those because, you know, we know in other species that they... <coughs> They stimulate feeding. Why are those essential amino acids? But they don't seem to help their female um, offspring with success at all. I mean, the balance could just be really off, so that it's just like small quantities of the sun. And, you know. mm -hmm. but what experiment was done to figure out if it could help offspring success? Um, basically, feeding females different numbers of these and then seeing how many offspring they had and how their offspring survived. Oh, by the way, I should say, proline was the, and glycine were the two largest components of the spermatophyllax by volume. I don't know if that helps. But you keep saying offspring success rather than just mating success. Yeah. I mean, so why are you focusing so much on the offspring success? I mean, like, you, you just want to increase your likelihood of having a female mate with you, so you're providing something. Right, but um, let's we, say that you did we, it in such a way that you had a, like a ton of, I don't know, babies and they all sucked and then they died and then your genes would be passed on. So it's kind of, you got it's like taking the long view. Well, we, I mean, we were talking about dating too and I was thinking about all the different senses now that we've incorporated into yeah. the dating market. The fact that chocolates for, yeah. for taste, uh -huh. uh, creating or composing music for... <laughs> You know, stimulation of yeah. what you hear or a fashion for how you appear. Perfume, yeah, perfume or pheromones. So, um, I, I would just, I, I mean, I'm just looking at it as you're presenting something rather than nothing, which yeah. is increasing your likelihood of just being able to. But it's actually it. harming the females because it's preventing them from going on and mating with other males so that they can have genetically diverse offspring. Yeah. So that's a cost. I don't know, I don't no, no, it was interesting because yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm off. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess my, what I'm fascinated by is the fact that uh, the, these are shared by the same genes, and so you're just 
uh, to a certain extent. So well, they're not necessarily controlled by the same genes. They're just, I mean, this is a quantitative genetic study, so they're linked. So they're unable to evolve independently, but they're not necessarily controlled by the same genes. People, so it just seems like a very elaborate scheme, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the, the clue is something's worked out, because there's crickets everywhere. But, um, <laughs> but, but it just seems, from a genetic standpoint, what are they actually, the why is still very puzzling to me. Why are they linked to me? Not so much why they're linked, but why this kind of elaborate push and pull here, mm -hmm. when it doesn't, I don't know how that confers fitness. Um, well, I mean, it, 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 it confers fitness for males and females are opposing it, is basically what it amounts to. Um, so, is, so is it the health of the male, basically, the kind of a reflection of it? So if you've got this unhealthy cricket, then the, the spermatophylax is going to be terrible. Thing. Uh, this is something that actually we're working on now, and so I don't know if I'm not doing it, but somebody else is doing it. Um, looking to see what qualities in the male affect the you know, acid composition of the spermatophylax, because at the moment, when we haven't been able to find anything yet. Uh -huh. Females aren't able to look at the spermatophylax and detect anything about the male's quality, which is kind of a shame because I actually have done studies and found that males who are in poor immunological condition actually make smaller spermatophyloses, um, and the females. Uh, don't seem to detect that before they debate that. Do, uh, do crickets have STDs? Yes, these crickets have an STD. They have a nematode that is sexually transmitted. So it doesn't seem to have like tremendous negative effects on their health, but they can actually pick up a nematode and pass it during sexual conflict or sexual contact. And they probably have other things going on, but nematodes are pretty big and much stuff. Is, is that potential reason why the, the was that version that the wings of the others so they, so you don't have the the, the male cricket <laughs> you know, like, you've slept with too many crickets I'm done you know like it's, well, is, I mean, it's, it's like misery yeah I think that's a big I mean that's a that's been measured in some groups not necessarily in, in this group I think yeah Usually across the board, males try to mate with virgin females because they have the highest reproductive potential. So they have the, they will fertilize the most offspring if they pick a female that's virgin. So usually, female fecundity in those uh, those insects peaks shortly after they become uh, uh, mature, and then it drops after that. And so, not only are they getting all of her eggs, they're getting all of them at her peak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a little bit more general, not specific to this. Research, but I'm wondering how much the study of sexual selection and this kind of work, um, how much it crosses over between um, evolution and biology and social sciences, and whether the way in which it is studied in other organisms is influenced by how we perceive ourselves and the language we use, and like a, the idea of a sham gift. I mean, the sex don't sham, right? Like that's a human construct. So, is how much? It, Excuse me, this sort of work crosses over between the biological sciences and the human, like the study of human. Well, there are people who study a lot of these concepts in humans. I mean, the people who study Right, so I'm just wondering how much the fields actually cross over and inform each other. Uh, sometimes, well, okay, so the best studies are like usually people who are working within the framework of evolution or biology looking at human questions. The worst studies are sometimes trash from any other disciplines. But sometimes people come from other disciplines and just cherry pick concepts from evolutionary biology without really having a good idea of the underpinnings for how these things would happen and then you get like some crazy ass conclusions and papers sometimes saying that something is, you know, is selected for I, you know, I don't really cast like, castle dispersions or anything. So I mean there's definitely concepts and you you know you see a lot of these things, you know, that you see in all the rest of the animal kingdom in humans. Um, it's just a question of it being very difficult to demonstrate that that these things are happening for evolutionary reasons because there's so much cultural layering over the top of it. Mm. I mean, you can definitely see similarities between, but I mean, calling the sham gift, actually in the paper we tend to call it, it's called Medea gift because it's a bad gift that actually harms rather than just being terrible. Medea, as in the woman who killed her children? Yeah, <laughs> it's a Medea, yeah, I don't know, I didn't make that one up either, but it's a, yeah, it's a sort of Medea gift because it's not only, it's not only not helpful, it's actually harmful. So the cricket could have given sham gifts, is that all they can give the sham gifts, or are they choosing sham or not sham? <laughs> 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 yeah, they can only make the kind of gifts that they can make. Um, they can adjust the 
size of the gift. So if a male um, doesn't so wait long enough between mating, he'll make a very small sham gift. Now, where that comes into play is that she'll chew on it for a shorter period of time and then go get the sperm packet out, so he ends up a loser that way if he can't produce a larger gift. <laughs> Sorry, I just didn't have any time to make you anything. Maybe is somewhat naive, but the sexual selection always puzzled me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, maybe lack, maybe my lack of understanding. Uh, it feels like if, if you are really so good. to laugh at that, but not. What? <laughs> Sorry, I tried and failed not to laugh at that statement. That's <laughs> a confusing aspect. Uh, it feels like, it, it's, it, I mean, the males can get away with passing on bad genes, like bad genes, if they have these uh, weird strategies uh, before the female, so to speak. Uh, now, it seems, even though it benefits the male, so it gets more offsprings, so the species as a whole, it, it can be deleterious. Right, so if they're competing with something else, uh, having a strong sexual selection flavor uh, that does not correlate well with actual uh, and stuff they do well measure otherwise uh, feels like a bad thing for the species as a whole. So how does that? How does sexual se selection survive in, in nature? Well, um, individuals are concerned about whether it's bad for the species as a whole. It's right. like no concern. If you have any doubts about that, look at what humans are doing to the earth, right? So, <coughs> It's basically each individual is independently trying to maximize their fitness, and if it doesn't end up, if it ends up causing that particular species to have a lower reproductive rate or, or to, to spread as the species less, you know, far, then so be it. But, um, but, but for some reason, like imagine two species, yeah. identical in every respect, except for this weirdness. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one without the weirdness, it, it feels like we're going out. Well, there's, there are papers like on that. Is there like a, a experimental evolution papers in which people like introduce different factors? I mean, I, I, I think that um, the way that you might be framing this could be a little bit, um, not, like you said, maybe a little bit naive. Okay. Because um, we're not really talking about necessarily um, because you give the female a sham gift that it makes the, the species as a whole degenerate. Um, essentially, they're still capable of doing everything else, okay. right? right? I mean, it's, you know, in some ways the male is, um, you know, having to use less energy to be able to uh, to mate with a female, but it doesn't mean the offspring that would be less fit, necessarily. So, so to survive there, it's not a cost somehow to, for them I mean, to compete with other, other species and the, the, in, that environment? In fact, it might be a cost to make a richer gift, right? Because you're having to invest more new, of your own nutrients you know, into making that. And so that means you're out having to forage for more, you need more. Um, and so if you can make a sham gift, um, then it means you might need less from the environment in the first place. Right, and there's always a check to it, right? So the idea is that sexual selection is, is checked by, if you were to make such a killer gift that the female wouldn't survive, then you would not pass on your genes to the next generation. And that particular trait would die out. So there's, there's always that, if you check by natural selection, if females prefer large antlers, and you have such crazy large antlers that you get eaten by, you know, by a dire wolf, then you're not going to be around in the next generation to have your offspring. So there's kind of a check in that balance. In terms of though, I just remember, I don't know, I kind of pay, don't pay enough attention to a lot of experimental evolution studies about what happens if you introduce sexual selection versus not in terms of um, genetics for the particular I don't know. Yeah. I can't that so that was interesting. So then the rodent that you had in the beginning that just mates and mates and mates and dies. There's no, is there no check to that? Like to stop them? They're just going and the the optimal is one ex, is one so extreme. Right. He doesn't need to live any longer than that unless he's the one getting pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> right. So he does what he needs to do. Like he puts all his effort into reproduction because there is no reason for him to live one day longer than the end of the mating season. Right. And you see this with salmon. It's kind of, too. A, it's kind of an amazing life. Actually. <laughs> you see this with salmon too. By the time the salmon get up the river to mate, they're rotting. They're actually they're actually rotting from you know from the inside out. They're basically just a bag of gametes waiting to meet up with the opposite sex. They don't leave anything. You know they use up every last little bit of resources just getting to that one point, and 
I mean, we're, we're used to thinking about species that have multiple opportunities remaining over and over again, in which case it's a more delicate balance between how many resources, how much of your resources you put into reproduction versus longevity. Because living longer may let you live to the, have more kids later, right? But not, you know, not some species. So it is actually 8 o'clock, and I want to kill the conversation if people want to keep going, just to let you know that it's, it is 8. Um, and if you are leaving, please fill in a survey before you leave. We can drink from one and half an hour. Thank you. 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 Thank you.